All right, let's move in now to the second agricultural revolution. And we've talked about this previously when we talked about uh, urbanization and the industrial revolution. All right, in order for the industrial revolution to take place, you have to be able to feed all of those people who are now coming to the cities looking for jobs. And they're coming to the cities looking for jobs because a lot of the jobs in the agricultural industry are starting to dry up a little bit. So for the Industrial Revolution to take place, you have to have the second agricultural revolution. We have to move beyond the subsistence agriculture that has dominated the first agricultural revolution uh, to generate more surpluses, right? We need to feed these thousands of people, again, that are coming to work in the factories. So the second agricultural revolution will start in the same place that we're going to see the industrial revolution take place, uh, mostly in Great Britain and then eventually moving on to the Netherlands and into Denmark. Uh, the second agricultural revolution is characterized by a series of innovations, improvements, and techniques with regard to agriculture. All right, so a couple of things are going to take place. Britain passes what's called enclosure laws. Um, they encourage people to, uh, instead of having these common farms, that we're going to have uh, a consolidation of fields into large single-owned holdings. Right? So you're going to have people owning the farms as opposed to them being owned uh, by the community. Farmers get, farms get bigger. Right? Um, they're going to have bigger farms and what they call crop rotation. Crop rotation is uh, let's say if I have a farm with four fields, right? I'm not going to plant the same farm, the same crop in every field every single year. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to plant probably three or four different crops, um, probably three, and leave one of the fields what they call fallow, right? Not making, it, not having planted anything. Um, when you let the soil rest for a bit, it tends to recharge itself, and it'll be it'll last longer. You'll be able to farm it for a longer period of time. Additionally, I'll rotate crops, so I'm planting a different crop in each one of those uh, fields because different crops use different minerals from the soil. And so if I am using a different crop, I am not taking the same minerals uh, as I did with the previous crop, and I'm going to give that some time to regenerate as well. Methods of um, soil preparation, fertilization, uh, the care of crops and harvesting is improving, as you see in the picture, right? That is a, um, the, the, that machine being pulled by the horses will harvest faster. If you guys remember back when we talked about agriculture a little bit, right? You are limited by the planting time as to how much you can plant, and you're limited uh, in how much you can plant by how much you can actually harvest. So if I can find mechanization that will plant faster, I can plant more, and if I can find machines that will help me harvest faster, then I'm able to take those crops in as opposed to leaving them on the field to rot. So what kinds of mechanizations are helping? Um, one is the seed drill, right? It is able to drill the holes and plant the seeds and I can go much faster than doing it by hand. Um, there's new fertil fertilizers, uh, artificial feeds that are not only making the plants better, but those feeds are also being used uh, in the animal domestication area. So I am growing, in effect, bigger animals for food. So I have more available protein. Uh, what you're seeing here is called the mechanical reaper. Uh, and that was by an American inventor. Uh, his last name is McCormick. And his company will go on to be what's called International Harvester, which was one of the biggest uh, and still is a very big uh, player in the agricultural field. Increased agricultural output because of these mechanizations and these new techniques means that it's possible to feed the larger urban populations that are coming. Uh, and as a result, right, if I can feed the people, they can come and then they can work in the factories and the industrial economy uh, gets its start and it will spread out of Great Britain and spread across Europe and then eventually into uh, the rest of the world, particularly the United States. Right. Farmers were no longer um, limited in their production by what they could, you know, sow or reap by hand, right? All these mechanizations are changing. Um, in addition to the 
uh, areas that we're seeing as far as how to plant and how to reap, we're also seeing the uh, benefit of the railroads, right? Benefit of the railroads helped uh, cities become industrial hubs, and now they're going to benefit agriculture as well. Um, railroad companies uh, advertised uh, in various different places in Europe to bring immigrants to the United States, right, to work in the Great Plains, uh, and so they would you know, pick them up on the, the coast and then take them by railroads over. So that helped move people to areas of more agriculture. Um, and then eventually the internal combustion engine, which we've talked about before, right, will also help move grain from the areas of agriculture and into the cities so we can go ahead and feed people, right? Um, the internal combustion engine also resulted in the uh, innovations of, of tractors, right, and other farm equipment. So where you see in this picture, you see the, the reaper being pulled by horses, eventually it's going to be pulled by a steam engine, and again, increases the speed and allows them to plant and harvest more food. Uh, banks are off also getting involved, and they are offering financing uh, to the farmers to be able to afford these particular um, new techniques, uh, not just the, the mechanization, uh, the, you know, those different machines, but also the various seeds and things that are coming. All right, so we're going to take a break for a second before we get to the um, third agricultural revolution, and we're going to talk about how um, these villages are laid out, right? We've talked about urban uh, different models that talked about how a city was laid out. Well, there are models that talk about how agricultural cities um, are laid out, right? Um, the model that you're seeing here is done by a uh, gentleman of, whose name is uh, Von Thunen, right? You'll find the spelling of his name in your book as well, right? Von Thunen noticed that when commercial agriculture is getting going, right, and commercial agriculture uh, is basically the next step beyond subsistence. We're not just making it for ourselves anymore, we're making it to sell uh, in the market and to feed the rest of the world, right? So when commercial agriculture is geared to producing food for a town, uh, a geographical pattern develops. Uh, and this use of land is based upon a number of different things, right? Von Thunen said, look, it's, we're going to talk about how perishable foods are, Right? That's going to make a difference as to where they are located, uh, and particularly the cost of transportation. Right? In, we're going to see in the next couple of chapters that cost of transportation have come down, but before that time, that was one of the most expensive uh, aspects of your business was transportation. So Von Thunen sees this model, right, and he's going to say, look, here's what things cost, right? here's how perishable they are, and we're going to try to balance it, right? How much am I willing to pay for certain things to offset the perishability of the, the foods that I am producing, right? So he's looking at the economic activity of the various different players in the market. All right, so if you look at the round circle, again, we see at the beginning the central city, right? The little dot in the middle, uh, very much like the urban models that we've seen before, right? It, the orange area around it, the market gardening and dairying, right? The, the most expensive land. As you get closer to the central city, the land becomes more expensive, right? So you're not going to want to use land that's, that's this expensive, right? Um, for things that use a lot of land. I'm, I'm not going to pay for big amounts of land uh, when I can get it cheaper somewhere else. So I'm going to save this area, the market gardening and dairying area, for the things that are perishable, right? the, for the things that need to be close to uh, the city. So in this case, we're talking about things like dairy products. Right? Milk doesn't have preservatives. We don't have refrigeration at this point. So you're going to want to keep those things that will go bad soon as close to the city as you can. Right? You're willing to pay the extra amounts for land, but remember, you're also not paying for transportation. So you're, you're saving a little bit of money there. So dairy products, things like strawberries and other things that will go bad as well. Uh, moving out to the second circle, you're going to see the green one, and that's for the forest area. There's a number of reasons for that. 
right? Forest is for wood, right? Wood is um, gonna what you're using to cook all your food and heat your home. So you're gonna want to have that fairly close because wood's pretty heavy, um, and you're going to incur a lot of transportation costs in transporting things that are heavier. You also want this for um, building, right? Most of your of your houses and other structures are built with wood, so you want it to be close. Uh, and additionally, right, having a little bit of forest is somewhat of a protection, uh, you know, from any kind of marauders or pirates or whatever people are coming at this point in time. All right, the next circle out are crops that are less perishable and bulkier. You need more land, so you're not going to want to pay for land that's close to the city. You need more of it. Right? And these are not perishable goods, so it's okay to be out further uh, from the central city. So you're going to increase your transportation costs because you have to move it in further. But at the same time, your land costs are going down. Right? So you're balancing your costs a little bit. So this is things like grains, all right? things that, again, aren't perishable, that can be stored. Um, they're fairly bulky to move. Right? So again, balancing costs to transportation, perishability of the good and the decreased cost of land. All right, the last circle out is for ranching or livestock. This is the least expensive land, right? It is probably land that uh, is probably not good for anything else, right? We usually tend to put livestock in areas that uh, the land's just not that great for farming. Um, and you, while your transportation costs might be expensive here, uh, particularly for this point in time, you're you're going to walk those animals into uh, the city. They're not you're not going to put them on a cart and then you know draw them by horses that far in. You're going to walk them into the city. Um, in addition to gardening and dairying that you'll see in that orange circle, you probably have an area where the cows go to fatten up. Right, so they have uh, land where they're not going to be moving very much. They're pretty much stationary, and all they do is eat and get fat, and then they get slaughtered. Um, and you're going to slaughter closer to home, again, because of the fact that you need to have them close by. There's no preservatives. There's no freezing. Uh, so you're going to have to buy meat every single day. All right. Like every other model, von Thunen has his assumptions. Right. The assumption one is that this terrain is flat. There's no barriers. You don't have to go up and down hills and over rivers. Um, the soil and other environmental conditions are the same everywhere just like every other model that we've seen so far. All right, and there are no barriers to transportation, and that means basically you don't have to go up and down mountains in, or across rivers. Right? Under these assumptions, it is, Van Thunen says, transportation governs what we're going to use the land for. Right? As the distance to the market increases, higher transportation costs are added to the cost of producing that crop or commodity. So if I'm going to buy cattle from the fourth area or grain from the fourth area, I'm going to factor in transportation costs in what I'm going to charge people for that particular um, you know, commodity. Also too, if you're inside that you know, second ring or first ring, you're going to have increased lane costs that are probably going to get passed on uh, to the consumer as well. All right? So you need to know that. This is a great free response question. You really need to un be able to understand and be able to articulate to the free response reader that uh, you understand the difference between the cost of production, the cost of land, and the cost of transportation, and why these various uh, different commodities are, are put in various different places. All right, so this is going to be the end of chapter 11.3, uh, I think. Um, and we are going to then pick up in the next one on the agricultural revolution, uh, the third one. Uh, you do not have questions that are due at the end of this particular one um, because you had a quiz and a study guide. So when we pick up in the next class, you guys are going to have um, another quiz and another study guide, and that will be the end of Chapter 11 uh, for quizzes and study guides. But we will finish and continue on uh, with the lecture. All right. Thanks, guys.